the margins of the UN General Assembly's 74th session and in marking the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Platform of Action and the 24th anniversary of the Beijing Women's World Conference and marking the 20th anniversary of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, especially Security Council Resolution 1325, which saw women as agents of peace rather than victims of war, and in marking the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment in the United States, we have one of the most celebrated women leaders in the world, President Rosa Otumbaeva, with us at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. President Rosa Otunbaeva was the first and remains the only woman to lead her country in the Central Asian region. She also is one of the few women in the world to lead her country through a peaceful transition to democracy. And she continues as a freedom fighter, fighting for justice, for democracy, and rebuilding her nation and her nation to engage in the 21st century economy, the global economy of new technology and financial inclusion. So with that introduction, I want to begin with speaking to the president about her role in 2005, that history-making role where she was at the forefront of the tulip revolution to bring democracy to her country. And her country was one of the forerunners of democracy, one of the first countries to build a parliamentary democracy. And she was instrumental in building that step by step. So, President, tell us about that historic role, that historic time that led to the Tulip Revolution in Kyrgyzstan and how that became a catalyst for the entire region in Central Asia. Thank you very much, Rangita, for such a warm welcome. Uh, I'm so I'm so happy to uh, come to Pennsylvania, famous university. Uh, your question about the uh, Tulip Revolution after 15 years, uh, it's uh, the whole history today, and in this rapidly uh, moving uh, world. Uh, uh, all sorts of uh, coal revolution, which uh, been under uh, ostracism over the decades, uh, it it uh, open up uh, a free world for us. My country in Central Asia is much more free and uh, open uh, environment country. And so when every country wants uh, to bring uh, uh, investors, visitors, uh, uh, tourists uh, to, to their countries, uh, having in mind their resources uh, or uh, of beauty of the country, my country attracts with this environment of freedom, environment of uh, uh, such uh, opportunities for young people. And scholar revolution, uh, uh, as much as uh, will be criticized uh, uh, in the past and today, that was really a change of uh, governance system, uh, democracy, what we fought for, it continues today. And we have a generation of devoted young people who want to live in democracy. President Otumbaeva, between 2000 and 2011, after President Bakiev stepped down, you served as the first woman president of Central Asia. And you taught the world how to lead a country that was emerging as a new democracy. You brought a plural system into life. You brought a multi-party uh, group together to build a new constitution, you set up a new parliamentary system, you set up an independent judiciary, and most importantly, you brought together women and women leaders to serve in the new government. So you took the ideals and values of the Security Council Resolution 1325, which saw that women's leadership does not end with the end of conflict, but it continues during 
the period of transitional justice, during the per period when democracy is being built and rebuilt in a country that is reimagining its place as a new nation. And you appointed the first woman chair of the Supreme Court, the first woman to head the prosecutorial office, and you head, headed the National Bank. The head of the National Bank was a woman, all under your leadership and under the auspices of your good governance. So can, so can you share with us those lessons of transitional justice, how you rebuilt your country through a plural democracy and through a plural governance system and through women's leadership. Thank you for such a generous reading of those events uh, uh, and uh, how you wisely applied uh, all these very important documents uh, to my country's reality. But uh, in fact, uh, that was a very tragic events and uh, uh, I must tell you that uh, one and a half years when my interim government worked over this uh, period, uh, we uh, got a situation when uh, uh, the power was uh, uh, completely crushed and uh, we supposed to build uh, every branch of the power. Uh, we, uh, 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 we, we have uh, conducted uh, parliamentary election, and uh, new parliament uh, came to the seats. Uh, out of this uh, parliament, uh, we have built uh, uh, governments. Uh, and then, uh, after a while, after a year, uh, we have conducted presidential election. And uh, uh, as soon as president was uh, uh, elected, uh, I have passed uh, the power to him as it was decided uh, uh, before. So that was the first uh, peaceful transfer of power and I left uh, the position. Uh, in our region, uh, no, uh, never it, it took place. Uh, for everyone who come to the power, they think that this is for, given forever and uh, it, it is not transmissible and uh, uh, we have shown to the region, at least, that uh, uh, power is uh, something what belongs to nation, and nation look after the, uh, watch the constitution, and constitution says that after your term, you should transmit, uh, transmit the power. So that was really something new uh, for, uh, for that historic period. And uh, um, uh, why I was chosen in this period, uh, it's happened so that uh, I was uh, the most uh, sort of known uh, in international environment. Uh, I was probably older than other my colleagues. Uh, and uh, they, uh, they had a trust in me. They thought that uh, this is the most uh, difficult and decisive time. And we want uh, that she would let us, because we had in, uh, uh, all the opposition came together, all sorts of uh, the people. Uh, uh, very often they are controversial to each others. And uh, I uh, want to stress that women can unite all these forces. Women can lead in very, very such a dangerous time in a very uh, difficult, on the, on the very difficult road. So I, uh, my nation at least, they do believe that uh, it took place, it's happened, and uh, young generation of girls, they do believe that, uh, look, women might be president and they might be successful. And it, it was in our country's history and that uh, I hope it will encourage them in the future. So those were such wise words, the ways in which you led a peaceful transition in your country, but also taught the other countries in the region ways in how a peaceful transition needs to take place in a democracy. You taught Armenia and many other countries are learning from you and the way in which you led this transition, how to step down, as you said, Power belongs to the people and not to the person. But you have still not stopped in your efforts and your uh, ambition to rebuild your country. You continue both internally 
in Kyrgyzstan as a champion for democracy and globally as a champion for freedom, justice and democracy. You were just recently recognized by the Kuwaiti um, leadership. And what was interesting there is that you used the award that was given to you by the Kuwaiti government to plow back into your foundation, the Rosa Otumbaeva Foundation, to rebuild your nation, to create a technology app so that the women of Kyrgyzstan in the frontier provinces could learn important lessons on how to raise their children, how the raising of children is part of the development of a nation. It is about the new generation and it is about rebuilding a nation. So can you tell us a little bit about the ways in which you and your foundation is leading not only democracy uh, uh, efforts, but the ways in which democracy and development are so inextricably interlinked? You're right. My country is emerging country and it's a new country and it's our uh, obligation and task to build this country. We are happy that uh, uh, for, uh, we have uh, such a beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, uh, from point of nature country and uh, we have a young nation out of six million, more than half they are young uh, people. And uh, this is a great opportunity really to build a very uh, developed and educated nation. I learned a lot from uh, America's experience. I was in touch with uh, Clinton Foundation in the past and uh, I read a lot about Carter's Center and uh, his foundation. And uh, I do believe that we should also set up such example that uh, a president who left the office, he would continue to work. It's not necessary to uh, to be on uh, such a high position uh, to feel yourself as sort of a governor uh, of uh, people. Uh, so uh, this uh, president's work continues uh, wherever he is or she is. And uh, my foundation, which I set up uh, right after when I left uh, the office, uh, we, uh, for, uh, we aim, first of all, uh, development work. And in the development, we have uh, so many things to do. It's absolutely open field. And uh, primary uh, objects, uh, objectives of my foundation are education. And uh, uh, I put forward on the agenda of my country uh, uh, early children's education and uh, we uh, teach, uh, uh, no, we introduce to my country new uh, such uh, uh, trends in the, uh, in pedagogic like uh, Montessori, uh, like uh, Waldorf uh, uh, pedagogic. Uh, this year is, by the way, 100 years of uh, Waldorf uh, pedagogic and uh, we'll celebrate this and teach that way of my people. So I open uh, every summer uh, 100 kindergartens in the very high pastures in the mountains mm. because uh, my country is agricultural country and uh, a lot of shepherds, they go to uh, uh, pasture their sheep and uh, children, they don't do anything during the summer. They are poor, uh, children of poor people. They can't go somewhere for trips abroad. They just among those sheep. And during the summer, we open those uh, kindergartens or educational centers, and we teach children and their parents also all sorts of things. I bring theaters there. I bring uh, students there. And uh, for everyone, uh, put their uh, knowledge uh, how to raise those children, uh, uh, raise those children up. So this is uh, just one example. Otherwise, of course, uh, we do a lot of educational work in my country, like, uh, as you rightly mentioned, uh, this uh, app. App is necessity today, a mobile app, because uh, uh, everyone in developing countries, they have mobile phone in their hands, but they don't have magazines, beautiful magazines. They don't have newspapers who will reach very remote 
places in the mountains. So then app will be only available uh, instrument uh, which uh, will be uh, uh, effective for them to learn about uh, um, not just new things but old things also because even women she raised one uh, child and she got in two three years another she forget everything how uh, she raised uh, what what she has done so the, all these uh, elementary um, steps in education feeding uh, hygiene and so on we want to send all this information to every rural woman my country still has about 65% of population living in the countryside and uh, this is uh, for them vital and important. Uh, I do believe that uh, uh, we must use new technologies today and so this is the only way how we can reach them. So from early childhood education to digitalization of your country, you're engaged in a rising Kyrgyzstan and in that effort on bringing new technologies to your country you have been working with the diaspora community in uh, in helping them to rebuild a knowledge economy in your country and you're using as you said the mobile phones and the mobile phone industry to look at the way in which remittances, mobile money is being transferred easily back and forth by the diaspora community. But you're also working with different stakeholders, including journalists, and in building what you call the Investigative Journalism Foundation, in engaging journalists in new technologies, in ways in which new technology can help to connect but also to rebuild democracy and to build accountability. So the use of technology as a tool for democracy and development is now something that you are deeply engaged with. And you have been recognized by so many international institutions for your work. You serve on the high-level mediation group that the Secretary General set up in 2017 which consists of 18 eminent persons and heads of state. You also uh, serve along with Jeffrey Sachs of Columbia uh, on the advisory group for the UN, um, UN's Leadership Council on Sustainable Development Goals. So you really bring the Sustainable Development Goals and its goals on innovation which a, and connection which is the 17th goal and innovation uh, and peace building which is the goal number 16 and goal number five which is on gender equality so you're really bringing them all together in creating this new agenda for development in Kyrgyzstan so can you talk about the ways in which you link the local to the global because I think that's what you are doing now in building those bridges? Uh, I must tell you that uh, in developing world, everything what is written uh, and uh, decided uh, on the global uh, uh, agenda, it's very difficult to apply and uh, to implement. It's not easy. Uh, when we are talking about those 17 uh, development goals, about the uh, objectives of uh, program 2030, it's somewhere uh, for, uh, far away from us, and uh, we need examples. We need uh, uh, for such a stimulation to uh, to bring uh, back uh, all these uh, new experiences and uh, how to reach those goals. Uh, uh, that's why uh, this uh, uh, Jeffrey Sachs uh, uh, Leadership Council is so important because uh, I'm learning. Uh, for uh, my country, for my region, what, uh, what uh, might be done. And uh, as in any country, uh, of course, the uh, United States is, uh, and develop, developed world is different, but for the developing world, digitalization, uh, struggle against corruption, this is high agenda for our countries. And uh, when we are talking about the digitalization, of course, uh, the, it, it must uh, go to every person, to every institution. 
And uh, when we come to the West, uh, we, we just, uh, for us, it's wonder how you move so quickly ahead. You do this way and this way, and uh, we are just catching up. And uh, it's really very difficult for the uh, developing uh, countries uh, to, uh, for, to, to get uh, to reach your pace. Uh, this uh, um, matter of uh, uh, digitalization uh, in the uh, for, um, in our life in uh, uh, everyday life for example this mobile uh, uh, mobile money you are talking about uh, my country has a lot of uh, migrants working uh, in neighboring countries in Russia in Kazakhstan in Turkey so uh, for, they sent a lot of uh, remittances. So uh, for, we must open those mobile purses, uh, let's say, mobile money uh, should be then operated by everyone, mm -hmm. sent back to the countryside or operate here. Uh, so uh, for, uh, this is, uh, the, that was the objective which my foundation has found, mm -hmm. to teach people 50 plus, mm -hmm. If women of my age who learn this, then she would uh, teach her husband, she would teach all the family, children, and everyone started to be mobile uh, very much. Uh, so this is uh, uh, one of uh, my projects. And uh, in the developing world, we need very much push forward institutions like banking, like uh, uh, in school, in, uh, in your country, probably everyone, uh, all the parents, they just follow um, uh, by internet uh, how, what is his behavior, his children, and what kind of marks he got, and so on. Not uh, still in our countries. Security uh, of children, everything. So we must implement this. In health system also, there are a lot of things to do yet. And understanding of people, uh, this is, it, it, it comes very slow. When we have a look at what's happened and what's going in the developed world, of course, for us, it's just a wonder and wonder and wonder. So, in other words, uh, uh, for such a foundations like my, many other NGOs, we work very hard to bring our countries to the modern uh, space. Regarding uh, our diaspora, as I told you, we have uh, uh, a lot of migrants going outside of the country. I have built over the, the last eight years this diaspora movements. We have a lot of those people around the world and we are learning from other countries. For me, example was Indian movement. Uh, non-residents of India. I have seen this big uh, meeting in New Delhi um, many years ago, and I thought, look, this is exactly what we need. And uh, coming back, I set up such a project. Uh, uh, I must tell you that Switzerland was very instrumental to support us uh, with this regard, and uh, IMO uh, for International Migration uh, of, uh, Organization. So uh, we have built this uh, project, uh, which is uh, quite successful. After uh, seven, eight years, it is now established movement. And uh, last year when we had a forum, almost every year we had a forum uh, gathering all this uh, diaspora in uh, uh, the capital of my country, and uh, they would come back. Uh, they would come, and they would listen our ministers and uh, sometimes head of the government. Uh, uh, what is the status of development in the country? What country needs today? It, is it uh, goes uh, in the right direction or not? If it it was before, then they would come uh, home and uh, just leave after a while, meeting with their relatives. That's it. Now they are coming and someone is listening to them. They are learning about the status of the country. Now their mind and heart started to bind to the country's fate. They would start to think, what can I learn? What can I bring back? Not just the remittances to their families, but also new technologies, new approach, new views. A vision about the country. So, and today, of course, they push us. Look, we should think how country will develop in 20 years. 
uh, how a country today raised the children. Why not during the summer, uh, me as doctor who works in Germany, will come to my region at least and uh, um, make uh, sort of uh, uh, possible, have a look of the people, patients who needs my expertise. And uh, uh, teachers would tell, okay, why not I would uh, really just a volunteer for a month to teach them English language. So that's how we uh, wake up uh, these people's potential to look after the homeland. I think this is important. And I must tell you that I learned from all of the world. Look at African countries. They are so active uh, uh, with this regard. Look at Asian countries. So, I mean, this is really the world has globalized and uh, uh, efficiency of this. Decade by decade, it's, it's getting to be very, uh, such a, uh, it, it, it grows. Armenians are beautiful, brilliant example with this regard. And uh, uh, we've learned this year going to Armenia, how Armenian uh, established people abroad. They, they, they are really now a lot of rich people. They bring back to Armenia absolutely new technologies, a new way how to develop country. So this is such an innovative way of harnessing the potential of the diaspora community to rebuild uh, the economy of Kyrgyzstan and to build a knowledge economy through innovation, through new technologies, through new thinking and innovation. And you've really helped to mobilize and galvanize this new movement that is now being taken over by the government, by the president of Kyrgyzstan and institutionalized. So this is really part of your legacy. And uh, your references to women over 50 who are now part of the digital economy because of mobile money, because of financial inclusion, really resonates because these women were previously unbankable. These were not women who had access to bank accounts, but because of the mobile phone industry, they are now part of the global economy. They are part of the market in Kyrgyzstan. And they are now leading their families, their communities into the global economy through mobile money, through financial inclusion, and through these digital purse, uh, which has now become the key word for financial inclusion in many parts of the global south. Now, you were recently recognized, well, it was really last year, by Search for Common Ground as one of their honorees for leading a peaceful transition in your country. And you were part of a constellation of honorees, including Desmond Tutu of South Africa and Jimmy Carter of the United States. So you continue to be a beacon for peace, for justice, and for peaceful transitions. Now, I want to end with a statement that was made by your detractors when you were the president of Kyrgyzstan. They accused you of leading like a woman. And I think that is a badge of honor, President Otumbaeva. To lead like a woman, if it means to lead the way you did, to bring about democracy, to rebuild the economy of a country, the parliamentary system, the justice system, and then to step down at the end of your tenure and to leave a country peaceful and secure. If that is leading like a woman, I think all leaders need to lead like a woman. And that is our clarion call to action during the 74th session of the UN General Assembly. May all the world leaders who are gathered here at the United Nations in New York learn to lead like a woman, learn to lead like President Otumbaeva. Thank you.